Okay. Well, let's see here. We're going to try to stay on schedule. I know we're, you know, we're going to keep moving on right ahead. I've got a couple of minutes after 9.30. And we've got the agenda here. So we're going to see how we proceed here. And of course, you know, small turnout. No, really no surprise with it being week of Thanksgiving. And, and, uh, are we recording now, John? Or? We are, we're going. We're going. Okay. I've got my agenda right here in my pocket. All right. So, week of Thanksgiving, small crowd here, but uh, one, of course, give thanks. Week of Thanksgiving here, and uh, thank my, my colleagues, my wonderful colleagues, for for attending and presenting and, and uh, working with this again. I believe this is the third time we've done this. It's uh, gets better and better each time, and that's the way you know, things should should do that. Get more experience and. Uh, Things come together, you learn from your mistakes, and you move ahead. And so, anyway, I want to welcome all of you. Come on in. Welcome to the workshop here, How UA Libraries, and its history of publishing. We've got tools, techniques, and tips. And as you're coming in, we've got a sign-up notebook up here at the front. If you will, put your name and your email address on there. And after the presentation, uh, maybe, maybe after Thanksgiving, but I will send you a follow-up email, and if you would like to receive a copy of this presentation, audio, video copy, we're recording this today, so we can send that out to you, and there will be people, as it's been in the past, that contact me afterwards and say, I really wanted to be there, I couldn't make it, was it recorded? Well, this, like I said, this is the third time we've done this, and the second time we've recorded it. So it's, uh, we will uh, get, a, get a recording out to you. So we appreciate you and your, your interest and we appreciate your patience with us as we uh, get this pulled together. And uh, it's just wonderful, the technology that we have here. And, and again, like I said, my colleagues, we've got uh, uh, John Ezell over here, he's working with the technology, he's pulled this together and I thank him for, for doing that. And then I wanna thank my colleagues, uh, uh, co-workers here. Uh, I've got Karen Chapman. She's the uh, Director of Branch Services and she will be one of our speakers today. And uh, then we've got uh, Vin Scalfani. He works at the Science and Engineering Library and he's uh, another one of our speakers. And then we also have uh, uh, Sing Hyun and she is with the uh, Department of uh, Human Nutrition and Hospitality Management. And uh, her specialty is in nutrition. And of course, that's very relevant with this uh, week of Thanksgiving. Now. I tend to, tend to eat a little too much uh, the good sweet stuff, and it's not very nutritious, but I uh, thought uh, maybe she can give me some pointers on, on uh, what, to, what to go for that's very nutritious. All right, and so uh, as we're going throughout this, uh, if you have any questions, uh, Feel free. I know this is sort of a drop in, drop out. You may have other commitments that you have to go to. So, um, you know, we want you to be able to get your questions. Uh, we, we will have time at the end for a Q&A. But uh, personally, the way I like to do it, um, you know, feel free to stop if you've got a question along the way. But like I said, we will have time for Q&A at the end. And always you can follow up with an email or a phone call and reach out and touch, so that's, that's fine. So my name is Paul Brothers, and I, I work in the Bruno Business Library. And uh, my, my, me and my colleagues, we all have varying levels and degrees of experience with publishing. And uh, so we want to present some resources to you today. We've got several databases the University Library subscribes to that we have access uh, if you're affiliated here with UA, so we've, we've got these resources that you can use to help, these tools that you can use to help with your publishing. And then each of our speakers will give you valuable information based on their personal experience with publishing. So this is a really rich time of uh, learning about the resources, some of the resources we have here for you, and then getting firsthand experience, firsthand knowledge, from, from those uh, who, have, who have published and are publishing and uh, look to publish in the future. So it's a great opportunity. And so we're gonna talk a little too much, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and try to stay on schedule. 
And our first speaker is Professor Karen Chapman, and I'll turn it over to her now. And, uh, appreciate your, your patience, and uh, look forward to hearing from Karen. Thank you. All right, thanks, Paul. Now, Paul asked us to share with you our background, so my first slide here is a little bit about myself, so you know my credentials and how I feel like I have some things to share. Um, I did make a mistake on this slide. I'm so sorry. It's four editorial boards, not five. I got a little carried away there. So uh, I have published throughout my career, and I now serve on these editorial boards, and I review for several journals, both in business and library science. So I'll be telling you some about tools and tips for getting published, and I'll also, in a little, little while, tell you sort of what the reviewer's point of view is and what happens when you submit your article, what the reviewer's looking for. Okay, let's start off with something really basic, which is the format of a research article. The outline that you see on the screen right there is very standard, very typical. This is, you know, almost any subject you're going to see uh, a research article organized like this. You'll have the introduction where you're going to explain what it is that you're researching. You want to explain why it's important. And then the literature review, where you're going to give an overview of the literature that's related to what you did. Uh, it may be that you will also want to cite articles that use the same methodology as what you did. Um, then at the end of your literature review, you need to explain how your research builds on this prior work. All right, then you'll have the methodology you want to explain in enough detail that the reviewer can understand exactly what you did along the way. Uh, again, if, if you're using a methodology someone else developed, then go ahead and reference that and cite it. Uh, then you want to give your results and then the discussion. Sometimes these are combined. Sometimes it makes sense to combine them for it, but I think in most cases what you're going to see is just a presentation of the results and then You'll, you'll have a discussion section where you'll talk about the implications. What do those results actually mean? Did they answer your question? What do they tell us? And then finally, the conclusion. And two pieces of the conclusion that you're going to want to include are limitations of the study. Was there something about your sample? Was it uh, you know, something about your research question? Is there something you didn't, weren't able to address? And then suggestions for future research. What would the next steps be? So all of those are typically contained in a research article and laid out in that, very much in that order. Okay. I'm just going to kind of describe a little bit about the process, the thought process you're going to go through when you're working on your publishing. Uh, the first thing you want to do is make sure you have a good idea, something that you're really interested in, because you're going to be spending a long time working on this. Articles do not come quickly. Uh, so make sure it's something you're really interested in and can get excited about. Now, I do recommend that you choose your journal very early on, as, even as you are figuring out what you're going to research, because it's really going to be helpful to you if you know who your audience is going to be when you do your article. So you want to think about who would want to know about this, who would be interested in this research, and then what journals serve that audience. The other thing is that you want to review the author guidelines for that journal and make sure that what you do, what you put together as a final product, fits what they're looking for. You want to look at issues of that journal to make sure that they're actually publishing articles of that type or similar articles, and then you'll know that they're going to be more likely to accept what you've done. So identifying that journal early on is going to be really helpful to you when you're putting everything together. Okay, um, again, you're going to do your research and then after you've done your research, you're going to start preparing your paper. Look at the author guidelines. You know, I'm going to say this over and over again. I think Ben repeats this a lot too. Check the author guidelines because the author guidelines are really your, your, um, your explanation of all the pieces you need to produce. Do they like graphs? They don't like graphs. They want photographs? They don't like photographs. Uh, look at other articles in the journal. Go back and check the author guidelines. Um, and make sure when you're preparing your article, you set it up the way that they want it. Some, art, some journals will say, for example, 
when you prepare tables, go ahead and put them in with the text and submit one document. But others will say, no, we want each graph or each table to be its own document. And that's, you know, that sounds kind of like a minor thing, but when you're putting everything together, you need to make sure that you set it up correctly. So check the author guidelines, make sure that you're doing what they've asked you to do. So if you reach a point, you check the author guidelines, you have all the pieces that they've asked for, and you submit. You're probably going to do that in an electronic uh, submission platform. They probably have a link you click on. I'm actually uh, an edit on the editorial board of a journal where they don't do that, and you really just, just email a Word document to the editor, and that's what you do. But that's pretty rare these days. Most publishers have an online platform where you go in, and you fill out a form, and you upload your files. Okay. Then you wait, and you wait, and reviewers check your work, and then they send back response, and like the most likely response is going to be a request to revise. And it may be small revision, it may be large revision. We're going to talk about that more later. We're talking about most of these pieces later. Uh, so this is just the overview. But uh, then you will need to respond to what the reviewers have asked for, and you might have to go through this process more than once. You might do a revision, send it back. They might want more revisions. Then you'll have to do that and send it back. But just keep doing that. As long as they are interested in your article and they keep giving you suggestions, just keep improving your article until it reaches the point where they're ready to accept it. Okay. Let me repeat again. Choose your target journal early. I, just, I've, I have found that to be really key because it helps me know who I'm writing for. So as soon as I write that introduction, for example, I know what audience I'm writing for. It's the readers of this journal. The journal explains their scope, and so I understand who these people are I'm writing for, and that way I can write in a way that's going to appeal to that audience. I really like this tip to write as you go. I did that once. I had a co-author who had mastered this, and I was working with her, and we would, you know, she had some ideas that she pitched to me, and I said, yeah, I'd like to work on that with you, and she'd already done the introduction. And as we did the lit review together, you know, she was writing that lit review, and as we were collecting the data, she was writing up the methodology, and when we were finished, you know, I sent her my results, and she plugged them in, and then we discussed what it meant, and she wrote that up, and we hit the conclusion and submitted it. And it was so smooth and wonderful and fast, and I thought, wow, I should do that every time. Haven't done it since, uh, because I just don't have the self-discipline to do it, honestly. I'm really bad. I do the whole thing. What appeals to me is not the writing. What appeals to me is figuring out the methodology and doing the data collection and then seeing an answer emerge from the data. That's what is fascinating to me, not the writing. And so I put off the writing until the last minute, you know, last minute, until everything else is done, and then I sit down and try to write the whole thing. Let me tell you, that's not the way to do it. So take some advice and try to write pieces of it as you go. Okay, the title needs to be clear. I know people think catchy titles will get attention, but if people don't understand what your article is about, they might look at that catchy title and think, oh, that's clever. I wonder what that article is about, and then they're not going to click on it. So think about something like Google Scholar. When you go into Google Scholar, you see the title of the article and then maybe two lines. Uh, so you don't get much help in Google Scholar with people, you know, with them telling people what your article is about. Your title needs to tell people what your article is about if you want them to open it and read it and use it. So make sure your title is clear. If you, you know, use that subtitle and really pin down what you're talking about in your title. And then my last suggestion would be to use a good professional name. Think about from the very first publication, be consistent with what name you use. Think about using a middle name or a middle initial to distinguish your name from other people's. That's something no one said to me, and I didn't use a middle initial, and now I have all these publications with just a first and last name. Unfortunately, you would think Karen Chapman wouldn't be a terribly common name, but it is. So, you know, somebody searches for works by Karen Chapman, and since I don't have a middle initial, their search pulls back Karen S. Chapman, Karen J. Chapman, Karen Z. Chapman, and, and the others who are like me that are just Karen Chapman, and it's a big mess. So if you want people to be able to identify your work and 
know who you are, make sure it's right from the beginning, you figure out what your professional name is and use that name. Okay. Now there are two things that I want to show you very quickly. I'm, I know I'm running over time, so I'm trying to go a little faster here. All right. Two tips that you need to know about. Staff directory on the library's homepage. Now I hope you've all seen the library homepage before. I don't know if you've ever paid any attention to staff directory. When I click on that, I get this nice page with members of the library staff and librarians. And what I want to bring your attention is this little liaison area where you can choose a subject. And I clicked on that, and this is the box that I got. So now I can choose a department. These should pretty much line up with the university departments. We can choose a department and see who the librarian is who is assigned to that department. So I see James Gilbreth is the librarian for the Advertising and Public Relations Department. That means he is a resource person for you if you're in that department. And he is absolutely at your service if you are stuck trying to find a document, if you need to know, you know, maybe you're trying to do your literature search and the searches don't seem to be pulling up what you're expecting, uh, talk to your librarian. The librarian knows how to do searches in your databases. The librarian can give you advice on which databases you ought to be in. So this person is a very much a resource person for you, and they will welcome you coming to them and asking you for assistance with your research project. Okay, the other thing I want to show you is a database. So I'm going to go to Research Tools and choose Databases. And the one I have in mind is called Sage Research Methods. So I'm going to click on the S, scroll down, and I'm going to click on Sage Research Methods Online. This is a very special kind of database. This is not the kind of database that you search when you're doing your literature review to find articles. This database is for researchers, so what it has in it is materials to help you do your research. So, we have a nice search box, and I know the temptation is to jump right in and put something in the search box, but I'm going to scroll down the page first. Here are the different types of things we have here. They have books, uh, they have reference books, encyclopedias, they have videos, books about quantitative methods, books about qualitative methods. The cases actually illustrate different methods. So if you think you're going to do, do something, uh, oh, let's say you're going to use focus groups, and you'd like to see where someone else has used focus groups and kind of how they set them up and how they reported it, go into cases and they will show you some examples. Data sets, if you're going to run a statistical test you're not familiar with, go in here and find some place where they provided you a data set so you have all this data you can practice on before you get your data. And then Project Planner we're going to look at in just a moment. And they also have podcasts. If, now SAGE does mostly cater to social sciences, but you can see from this list of subjects, they do, uh, they do offer things for other subjects as well. So you can even click on this and see the most used and most likely things for your particular subject area. All right, now let's quickly do a search. And I'm going to use my focus groups example one more time here and it gives me a definition and now you can see the very first one focus group methodology so it's telling me how to use focus groups you can limit it over on the side we don't we have not subscribed to every single piece of this database you might want to click on available to me to make sure you're actually going to be able to see what's here but if the book is listed there you're going to be able to see it on the screen and then you can also break it down if there's a particular type of thing you're looking for, and you can use these filters to break it down. Okay, let me also show you a few more things in the research tools. I'm going to skip over the methods map. Reading lists, you can actually uh, save these things that are useful to you in a list and give it a name. You can make that list public. So, for example, if you're teaching a class and you want your students to read some of this stuff, you can create a list give it a name, and then put a link to it in Blackboard Learn. You can also read other people's lists. So if someone else, maybe you're doing focus groups, you think, well, I wonder if someone else has already pulled together all the best stuff on focus groups. Go in and see if somebody created a list on it. Project Planner, I did want to show you because it's basically like what we're doing today. It's the steps in your research. When you click on something, it tells you a little bit about what you need to do at that stage in your research. It provides you with all these questions. 
and the answers. Do I do a literature review? And here's a brief answer, and then most of the time they will provide you one of these buttons where you can click on it and it will pull up some, some helps on how to do whatever they're talking about in that question. So this is a really nice thing to do too. If there's a stage in the research you're not comfortable with, you want to go through and get a little more information on that. And then finally, sorry, research tools, which stats test? If statistics is just not your thing, uh, this might be of some help to you because it just walks you through these questions. I'm just gonna kind of randomly answer here. And when you get down to the end, I'm just taking the first one each time. Let's see where that gets us. Then it tells you what test, what statistical test they recommend in that situation. So that could be kind of helpful. And then, of course, each one is a link. You can click here to get lots of sources, or you can click on the specific discussion points that they've raised there. Okay, so those are two really good places to look to get um, information on how to do your research, and that's your librarian, and SAGE research methods. Yeah. Thank you. You can arrange the content and write up your citations. So there's quite a few of those. So each journal will tell you in here, expect you to compose your, your, your work, all right? You also have these filters over here. So these are very helpful. I'm gonna encourage you to take a look at these. Is that drop down box there. Let's just quickly go over some of these. So you can get into the content by these different filters, by the disciplines here that they have. And you can see they cover a lot of different subject areas, accounting, computer science. And then they've got these different topics here under these disciplines. So you can find really quickly what type of journal that you can submit your work to. So this, uh, it's an amazing and very uh, deep and wide uh, area of, of publishing. There's a lot of different ways that you can get your, get your work published, thousands of publications. So you can see here, going down this list, again, some of the disciplines, computer science, economics and finance, there's health administration, management. I'm just naming a few of these, just quickly kind of glossing over some of those nursing, and then again, like I said, you got your, your topics up here, all right? Now, I'm not going to cover each of these aspects just for sake of time. But we've got also in here an impact factor. So in your, your field, uh, in your department, if you're someday you find yourself in, in academe and you're in, a, you're in a department and you want to, your school says you, know, you need to publish in certain journals and certain journals that have a, a, a particular reach or a particular impact factor that are more prevalent in your field. So you can specify here the impact factor of your publication. Over here, they've got these peer reviews. So these are the different types of publications here. And I like how they quickly identify the types of, of what these are. You know, we throw these terms out in the library world. Uh, blind reviews, double blind reviews. So based on the blind review, the reviewer identity is confidential. So you're submitting your, your work to that journal and you don't know who is reviewing it, okay? That, that's, that's anonymous, you don't know. And then the double blind, not only is the author, not only is the reviewer identity uh, concealed, but that reviewer doesn't know you. So it's, there's both those opportunities there to uh, provide for that um, anonymity there, okay? And then there's, of course, the editorial open there, both the author and reviewer, the identities are known. Over here, this is an important aspect here, the open access. This is something that, just real briefly, the libraries uh, were really encouraging 
authors, future authors, to consider open access. We want to think that this is the way of the future, and we believe that it is. And if you are publishing something that is with, uh, published with uh, grant money, typically if it's taxpayer supported, grant funding, there are requirements that you're publishing. It has to be open access. It has to be available for other taxpayers to see what type of research you've done. So they don't have to go and pay to access your article. They should be able to freely access it over the internet. That's what the open access is. It's available that anyone can obtain it through the internet. They can get to your content. And one of the reasons why libraries are really strongly encouraging this is because the cost of accessing these thousands of journals that we have access to through the databases that, well, Ben was covering these earlier, the Web of Science, the Scopus, web, those don't actually have the content in them, but they have the links out to the content through other databases. But the point is, it's very expensive for the libraries to access this content. We have approximately 600 different databases that the libraries subscribe to, plus approximately 100 software packages that we can use for various things, statistical software, and um, just, it runs the gamut. But it's very expensive, several million dollars per year to have access to these databases. It's just, just very expensive. So we want to be able to provide the content, but you can see the, the, uh, the content, the, the, the cost is just, and it increases every year. The cost just continues to go up. So with the open access, that will allow more people to receive the content and receive it. Um, with, with much lower cost, okay? But it's still, we're still a long ways from getting to that where all the content is completely free to access. So it's, it's a model that's changing. But anyway, I really encourage you to explore that. These are the different types of open access uh, models that are currently out there now. So I really encourage you to publish your, your work in an open access fashion. And we also, you know, we really are covering that really here in this presentation, but we have an institutional repository here at UA, and it's a, it's a great resource. I encourage you to explore that. There's a lot of really good research articles in there, research content. So take a look at that. It's called the Institutional Repository. All right, so this open access. All right, so over here with the bells, just quickly, I'm going to put in a publication. Again, there are thousands of publications here. But one of the, the publications that, that we use and I published in is the Journal of Business and Finance Librarianship. Okay? Bring it up here. It has an ampersand, so it's kind of Probably bring it up that way, but don't have business and finance librarianship. Enter there. Okay, so here's the publication. All right, so this is very specific to my area of, of, of work. Okay, so this is where business librarians like myself, we, we this is one of our top tier journals. Okay, so this Cabell's directory tells you some things about the Journal of Business and Finance Librarianship. Okay, and again, we can access a profile like this for thousands and thousands of publications here at Cabell's. Okay, so I'm just use this, using this as an example. So some of the things that you can find in here, and again, I'm just scratching the surface to have time to cover all the aspects here. But they tell you some things about, of course, who the publisher is, Taylor and Francis. It's published quarterly. Okay. Over here in the about, this is what we already have here. You can click on the metrics and 
put on contact information the publisher. But it tells you about the, the disciplines here, educational technology and library science, economics and finance. Okay, some other disciplines there it covers. It's an academic, that's the audience. Again, published quarterly. It gives you the international standard serial number, okay, when the publication was started, 1990. Tells you about the publication here, okay, some more content about the journal and who the audience is and what typically the types of articles they publish, okay. They tell you about the submission, the guidelines here, okay, so they publish on the web now, okay. The length of the articles, generally the length of the publications. The percentage of the invited articles. They give you the acceptance rate, okay. 50%, that's, that's a pretty good acceptance rate. Some publications have a very small acceptance rate, 5%, not unusual, okay. The style, American Psychological Association, APA. Okay, it's a double blind peer review publication. Typically two to three months to review it. They send you comments. Okay. They screen for plagiarism. Okay. But you can go here to the journal website. Okay. Need help preparing your manuscript. Lots of links on here. Very helpful resource, okay? And then they've got these other metrics up here. You can take a look at these and it's full of more items about the content and how they do the rankings and that sort of thing like that. But a couple of things too, is when you're in academia and you're in your, your department, usually your university, your college will have certain publications that are relevant for your particular field, somewhere your authors and your colleagues have been publishing and they're geared toward a, a specific discipline. And sometimes that, that expectations may be there that you will publish in those particular ones. So you can go in here and you can use something like a Bells and you can get that information about those specific publications. Just enter the name of the publication and get to that. That directory gives you profile information for that particular publication. So you can see it even covers a lot of different disciplines, but it's profile information about the thousands and thousands of academic journals where you can publish. All right, so I'll turn it back over to Karen, and she's going to give us some information on the reviewer's point of view now. Now, when you submit your article, the reviewer is going to take a look at it and deem it worthy of publication or not. So the reviewer is kind of the bad guy in your process, right? Because this is the person who stands between you and a published article. However, the reviewer is really just trying to make sure that your article is, that your, that your paper is well prepared and is something that's going to convey good, positive information to the readers. So don't try not to think of the reviewer as the bad guy, although it's, it's hard not to do that, I admit. All right, so you can see on the screen some sample questions. Let me tell you a little bit about what it actually, how it actually works from the reviewer's side. So you're going to submit your article through some kind of electronic form or you know, you're going to upload and everything. And the system will probably, if you, if you submit multiple documents, the system will kind of attach them together and create one PDF that has all of your, um, your text and your charts and everything in one place. Then the system will, the, the editor will go into the system and the system will probably identify some suggested reviewers based on keywords you might have entered. You might have been asked to supply the names of reviewers in some fields, that's common. So the editor has to decide who's going to review it. So they use their system or their own, the system or their own knowledge of the subject and who the reviewers are. And they select a few people and they put their names in. And the system sends that person an automated email and says, your name has come up, uh, would you be willing to review this paper? And it gives the title and the abstract. So the reviewer has a little bit of information to look at and see, yeah, this is something I'm, I'm good with reviewing, I can do this. 
Occasionally, I've gotten these emails, and I look at the abstract and think, why did they think I was qualified? I can't possibly uh, make reasonable comments on this article. And I have to say, no, I'm not going to review this article. So you get your reviewers, and there are often two or three. Three is pretty common. And the reviewer gets the paper, and they're told a deadline. Usually, the reviewer is given three to four weeks. That's or at least that's been my experience, three weeks, four weeks. So the two to three months it takes to review is not the reviewer the whole time. Some of that is the editor and, it, and the paper working its way through the system. The reviewer probably has three weeks or four weeks to actually review the paper. The reviewer also has normally a form to fill out. These questions on the screen are some of the ones that the reviewer is expected to answer when they provide their review. So I've seen this in several different ways. Sometimes it's just a straight question with a box and you can type in your answer. Sometimes it's a rating. For example, it's, it might be a sentence. Does the paper present something new? And then you have to agree, disagree on a liquor scale. Uh, somehow or other, you have to provide responses to these questions and they're basically standard questions for each publication that the editor has developed. So you can see the questions. If you are thinking about these questions when you write your paper, you can make sure that your paper answers them very clearly, and that way that will make life a lot easier for the reviewer and make it more likely the reviewer is going to approve your paper. Uh, the reviewer also has an opportunity, there's a box to fill in where they can send comments directly to you that are not part of this question and answer thing. And they also have a box that they can fill in where they send confidential comments to the editor. If they suspect you of plagiarism or if they think something's wrong, they might use that editor box to put that information. Usually what I do is just put everything in the comments to author, and then the comments to editor, I just say, see the comments to the author, because I don't really have anything confidential for the editor. So the reviewer is looking for all these things that you see on the screen, I'm going to you, but I do want to emphasize the last one, that so what question. Don't overlook that one, because your research needs to contribute in some way, it needs to have some kind of meaning, it needs to advance your field, create new knowledge, uh, if you've done something that, you know, there are things you can do that maybe you shouldn't do. Let me give you a kind of a goofy example. Uh, doing library research, maybe I did a study on old found journals and stacks and what colors they are. And I've done a study that identifies what the predominant journal cover color is for the different subject fields. Wow, I've gathered my data and I've run my tables and I've done my analysis. Who cares? You know, it doesn't matter what color the journals are. So make sure when you create your research question that you know how it's going to contribute to the field and to make it really clear in your paper. Okay. Occasionally it happens that a reviewer says, yes, this paper is fine exactly as it is, except. And if you can get multiple, multiple reviewers to say that at the same time, wow, that's really good. That does not happen very often because human nature being what it is, if you've got three people reading the same paper, at least one of them is going to have a suggestion about, oh, well, that table should have a different name, or you should create this additional table, or something. So it's really more common than to revise. Uh, sometimes that can be uh, hard to take because I know I've had so many times when I've said, when some of the reviewer says, you didn't comment on such and so you didn't read this out. And I think, okay, did he read page three? Because that's where I covered that. Uh, so you have to kind of think about what the reviewers say. And honestly, uh, Ben is going to talk about response to reviewers, but you need, do need to carefully consider what the reviewer is talking about. If, if he thinks you didn't say it, then maybe where you put it in the article is not the best place to put it. Maybe you need to rearrange your article. So think about the revisions, think about them carefully. Uh, if they're minor revisions, I would say, you know, again, I'll let you cover this. Sorry, I'm trying not to step on your, your part here. Um, think 
vacuum carefully, but do try to get on with them and get the item, get your article turned back in. Now, when I've talked about this before, I've been really insistent on, you know, drop everything else you're doing, get that minor revision done and get it back in. I was talking to an editor friend of mine, and he said, you know, you don't want to send it back so fast that it looks like you didn't really even pay attention to what the reviewer said. I thought, oh, okay. So, now I'm going to say, give it a week. You get that review back, uh, read it, set it aside, come back to it in a week, and think about it, and then, though, if it's fairly minor, go ahead and do it and send it back. All right, but make sure that you uh, do pay attention to what the reviewer said. It's a major revision that really, really changes up everything you did, changes your methodology, means you've got to collect more data. You need to think carefully about whether you want to do that or whether you want to just try submitting somewhere else. And then sometimes you get a flat out rejection. Uh, and that could be because you didn't answer that so what question very well. It could be there was a fundamental flaw in your methodology that you didn't even realize. Um, it's a learning experience, so you've invested in this project, so you'll, you'll have to just stop and think very carefully about what do I do now? Do I start over again, or do I count as just as a learning experience and move on to something else? So hopefully, you will never have to deal with that question. Okay, yeah. <laughs>
They seem like little details, but they would be important um, for that particular journal for editing uh, processes. And also, uh, no, it doesn't make any peer reviewers happy if you don't follow the guidelines, right? You have sections that are mislabeled or missing or figures that are not the correct format and so forth. So make it easier on, on everybody to, uh, by following the guidelines. There's lots of different submission platforms. Um, they vary tremendously. I, I would just encourage you to set aside when you're ready to submit, you've got all your materials ready. Um, set aside several hours to do this because it, it can take a while to, uh, you know, to register for an account, to upload all the documentation. As Karen said, sometimes they'll go into the submission platform and they'll want you to split up files like name manuscript, you know, figure one, figure two. So you might have to do multiple uploads. Um, so take your time with it. Um, don't, don't rush it. Um, most, uh, there's not a whole lot of publisher anymore that have you email articles, unless they're really small publishers and maybe uh, you don't have one journal or so. Um, for every time I've submitted an article, I've always had to submit potential names of peer reviewers. And the way I get these is um, generally in my citations, right? The, the references that I'm citing within the article give me a good idea about you know, who's an expert in this field. Um, so I try and, you know, pick authors that I'm citing and that, uh, you know, have published re related studies. Um, because ultimately, right, the idea of peer review is to get really helpful feedback. And so why not suggest names to people that you think will give you really helpful feedback, okay? There are some ethical considerations here which we won't go into too much detail, but generally, you know, stay away. Don't <coughs> suggest your friends, right, or other co-authors. You want to keep it um, as un unbiased of, of a review as you can. Uh, response to reviewer comments. Uh, so generally you will receive reviewer comments. I've only had it happen to me twice where manuscripts have been published as is. And uh, actually it's really it's the sort of dance that you, know, you made it through peer review without having any major comments or even minor comments for that matter. But then I've always felt disappointed that I didn't get peer reviewer comments. So it's sort of an interesting feeling actually that you don't get feedback because uh, most peer reviewers will, will kind of break down, well, at least in my experience, they'll break your article down into things that they sort of liked, uh, things that need major revision, and then minor comments. So I, I, I've always appreciated the um, sentences about you know, things that they really liked, right? So, it really was so again, with this, um, take your time. You want to address as many reviewer, and uh, sometimes the editor will even have some comments. A lot of those are, are copy editing type things. But you'll still want to address everything. And uh, there might be very good reasons to not address a concern. Uh, maybe, you know, if you were to address the concern, it would take another two years, or it's not really necessary. It's outside, kind of the classic line that I always use is this is outside the scope of this article. So you can kind of argue, you know, hey, this is a really good idea, but, you know, it doesn't change the conclusions and the significance of this article. That's more of a future work type thing. Um, so you can disagree respectfully and um, just say why, you know, wh why you can't address something or why addressing that is not critical to the significance of the article or the conclusions. Generally, um, it's a good idea to start a new document and put every reviewer comment, you know, number one, and then the response, number two, and then the response. And you can break these things out if they've organized them, you know, maybe it's the major step first. But then you can group all of like the copy editing or um, style, stylistic type of comments at the end. And generally with that, those, if they say, you know, if it's a word choice or if they say, you know, use active voice versus passive voice, I'll just group all those together and just say, thank you for the suggestions. Uh, this is complete, done, right? So you don't need to have a whole long explanation on that. Uh, there's always, uh, so I'll say, you know, be, be patient. Uh, these, some, some peer reviewers focus a little too much on grammar and things like that, but generally I found that it does, uh, it does improve the manuscript, so I, I generally just uh, accept their re revisions and, and, and add them in. But focus on, you know, the real major revisions, the scientific content, making sure if there's any uh, major revisions that, that you handle those appropriately first. 
Um, there's always that one reviewer that you kind of scratch your head and wonder if they read the manuscript and hey, you didn't address this, but then it's right, you know, it's three paragraphs on page seven. And so as Karen said, uh, just be patient because a lot of times that actually um, can be a signal that maybe organization's a little um, out of place. And, and so what I've done, how, how to address comments like that where you didn't address something but you did, is I'll, I'll add a few sentences to it and, and change the organization around it, and, and then I'll say that. And I generally, um, I've never had a response back from an editor that I didn't address. It. So uh, these things, these documents, these response to reviewers documents can can get quite long, um, but take it one by one, and uh, I've never had. And it, I've never had a bad experience where I've got a response to reviewers documents and then it hasn't gone through. So um, it's always been a positive experience. So, all right, I'll turn it over. I'm not a beneficial case on publication process. So uh, as an assistant professor, I'm just going to share my personal uh, publication process with you. My name is Sian Dong, uh, assistant professor from human nutrition. And uh, this is my fourth year. Uh, I'm also a dietitian as well, so my research focuses on food-related behaviors and psychosocial determinants associated with nutritional status. So currently I have a 17 peer-reviewed publications and currently working on a few res uh, funded research projects. So that's just a little bit of my background information. So we already covered why your paper can be rejected. But once you get an email saying that your paper is a rejected the publication. That's really embarrassing. But um, again, uh, Dr. Karen already mentioned that uh, it's sometimes really harsh comments that might impact on your, your emotion in your days. And my advice for you in that type of situation, don't take it personally. I mean, um, and also, sometimes the, the publication process is really complex and variable, and there are several reasons that why they rejected your paper, but sometimes they reject your paper because your paper is being out of their scope of their particular journal. So I think I really want to reemphasize it's really, really important to find a good journal, I mean, the best fit journal for your research paper. And also, when you get a, a rejection email, don't simply turn around and resubmit your rejected paper elsewhere without making any revisions. Uh, you take time and overcome your initial shock and uh, take a look at their reviewers, uh, the reviewers' comments and suggestions really, really carefully. And also try to understand uh, their point of view uh, in a constructive, constructive way to improve your manuscript. And based on their comments and suggestions, you revise your, uh, your manuscript and then you find another poem uh, that how the best fit for your research paper and then you resubmit your uh, your rejected paper. So I think that that's the first advice that I wanted to share with you. And also another thing that I want to emphasize, if you have a really two good ideas on your research paper, you might also consider that you break it down into two different manuscripts. Uh, so I think that that might be also a good strategy to improve your auto acceptance rate. And then also, um, at some point after you finish up your uh, graduate program and you might be interested in going into a tenure track position just like me, uh, all the college and all many many institutions probably have their expectation about their promotion criteria. So I think that as a graduate student, I think it's a good practice to maintain um, quality and quantity of your publication and also make sure you have a research in progress and manuscript being written and also the manuscript uh, in review at all times. I think that that's going to be something that I wanted to share with you. And also, just like everybody mentioned, um, it's really, really important to read author's guidelines really carefully and make sure your papers are consistent format and having the same style that they're looking for. So I think that that's the one thing that I really want to emphasize as well. And lastly, um, I was the first author for 10 manuscripts, uh, 10 publications uh, out of 17 publications. So when I just got back from my conference uh, over the weekend, and I met my collaborators and co-authors, and they all mentioned that you're so easy to work with, and you're so productive in communicating things that we have to work on together. So I think as a primary author, there are several things that you need to know. Um, clear communication, and also plan really well um, for all those processes of your 
developing your manuscript um, process. So as a first author, I, whenever you have a really good idea, I usually consult with my uh, co-authors and collaborators, and, um, and then we also discuss in what area that each person will contribute on, on your research paper. And also, I discuss the timeline that I expect it to be completed, uh, so that they will have, because everybody are very busy, everybody have a very busy schedule, and but you might have this timeline in your mind, but they might not be able to complete on their task within the timeline that you have in your mind. So I think that that's the one thing that you should do. And also, when you're submitting your manuscript, uh, make sure you keep them updated about the status of your main, uh, manuscript. Hey, I submitted my manuscript. But sometimes journal send out the automatic email to all co-authors that it's submitted to the journal and things like that. But sometimes they do not do that. So um, let them know that you submitted your manuscript and it's under review. And I received the uh, reviewer's comments and suggestion and things like that. So when you request, um, when you receive a revision request from the journal, I usually take a look at all the comments of the reviewers' uh, comments and suggestions by myself, and then I share all of the comments with them, but at the same time, I look at those comments very, very carefully and divide into a different section based on what other co-authors' contribution. So I just separate the files for each author's, my co-authors, and then send them separate email. Hey, these are the area that I want you to uh, work on for, re for revising our manuscript. And so I think a lot of times my collaborator told me that it was so easy instead of getting all those comments and suggestions, but since you separated this uh, portion of my part, it makes me so easy to work on. So I think that, that was the one strategy that I've been done and it was very effective. And so, and so once you're submitting your revision, revise the manuscript again, you let them know the status of the, your manuscript as well. So I think that that's, those are some things that I wanted to share with you today, and I'm hoping that everybody got a lot of information from today's presentation. And also, I really like to, would like to thank you for this opportunity because I'm a uh, first year assistant professor, and then when Paul asked me to be here as a guest speaker, I told him, I'm going to be eligible to present this type of information because I'm this four year assistant professor. So, but um, I'm hoping the information was beneficial to you. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate this. This has been very inspiring to me. I hope it has been to, to all of you as well. And so, uh, we stayed pretty, pretty well on schedule. I've got uh, it's about uh, almost to 11 o'clock. And so, uh, so we'll go ahead and schedule there. I apologize for me uh, going a little, a little longer on my part there earlier. But uh, anyway, here we are now at the, the Q&A. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to let's hear from you now. Um, if you think of something later, you know how to get in touch with me. My email is, uh, is on the on the flyers. You probably saw some of you have already communicated with me. So I uh, appreciate the you know, continue the conversation and um, you know, so we, we really appreciate you being here. Appreciate the GSA for helping to sponsor this. Appreciate the libraries for allowing us to have this nice room. Use this nice room here. And uh, we've got some coffee and refreshments over here, so please help yourself to those. And uh, I'm sure there'll be others who will get in touch with me, send me an email in the days ahead, and I'll be getting, disseminating this out to, uh, to those via email. And so uh, appreciate again to John for coming over here. It's that short notice, I apologize for that and uh, setting up the, the camera and the audio and, and all that. So uh, again, thank you, John, for doing that. And, uh, so does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists? Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question for Ms. Hartley. Um, she mentioned that she wanted to know about working at journals while they're still in writing. Um, would you suggest looking at multiple journals? Is that music with one article from multiple journals? Ooh, that, that's a big no-no. Um, you want to submit to one journal. 
So my suggestion was that you have a pretty good idea of what that term is going to be before you start writing. And that's so that you can target that audience and really focus and you know what your author guidelines are and know what your scope is. We talked several times about how important it is to make sure the article is within the scope. So if you already know what term you're writing for, you can make sure that the way that you present your information is not study is appropriate to that particular term. And it lets you exactly when you can Google to see what terms are within them. Or you can, but the trick there, of course, is you've got to find another journal where you can put it. So it may be necessary to rewrite parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I've done studies where I, on, in librarianship, librarians have lots of different kinds of responsibilities, right? So I write something and I might focus on a particular type of responsibility and send it to a journal that focuses on librarians who do that. But then my option also would have been to maybe show how what I did was relevant to a different area within librarianship and send it to that journal. So you can kind of, uh, depending on what you're writing about, of course, if you're writing about something super, super specific, there may not be many journals, but, but you can think about how, how you present what you did and what audiences would be interested in it. And that's how you can choose what journals. Along those same lines, I've always kind of thought like if you do go uh, to a different journal or maybe rejected or something, it seems like it's a, it's a major uh, a major job to have to repackage your submission with the two publishers' tables and bibliography and all that kind of thing. That's just part of the deal. Though. That's right. Now, yeah. if you use something like InDev or RefWorks, then that would help you with your citations and bibliography because you can just take the, the, the collection of References and just set your reports or email to change it to the uh, different style that the other journal has. But I found it's very awkward is that many journals have their very own style. And they say it's APA, but when you look at their examples, it is not really quite APA. So, yeah, you're right. You know, having to reset it, everything from other style can be kind of a pain, but you want to get it published, so that's just kind of something you have to do. Yeah, good point about the ref works. We didn't cover that this this go around. We we covered it in the past. But she mentioned ref works and in the, those are two very similar products. Uh, UA Library subscribes to both of those. They are excellent tools for keeping up with your content. You create your own personal account and it's in the cloud and it's a, a, something that you can keep once you leave the UA, you still have access to that resource. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a content management type of uh, device, a tool. So it has folders in there and you can have multiple papers going at one time in there uh, to store citations. So sometimes when you go into these uh, databases that have articles, and you get ready to export the citation, it'll give you those options. You can export it, um, click on the ref works or endnote, and it export, you'll open up your account, you'll log into your account, and you'll export that citation in there. And then you can manage it, like she was saying. So when you get ready to uh, publish your, or submit your article, you've got the work cited there, and you've got all the, the citations there. And it's just it's a wonderful labor saving labor-saving device because you can arrange the citations by the type of, of style that your journal requires, whether it's APA or MLA or Chicago Arabian or whatever the case may be. So you can arrange that, those, those, the bibliography, the work cited. So if you've got an article, you've got a hundred citations, my goodness, it will really save you a lot of time to just check those buttons, what citations that you want to use for that particular publication, you've already exported them there. You say, I want these 35 citations to go in this folder for this journal, which is going to this publication, and it needs to be arranged by APA style, or now in MLA, and it will check the box and it arranges those citations for you. So it's an incredible tool. Any other questions? Yeah, I don't know if you have any experience with the community paper and practice. 
Yeah, we actually, we are. So um, we're trying to, I guess, is, is your question to learn right tech or just have, have we ever seen it? Is that I have not the very bad experience with that. I arranged my document and then I'm going to be changed by the by just they couldn't compare the use that they can actually use so that. I have to collect everything in the world that I need to use one more for this. I know, uh, have, 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 have you heard of uh, Overleaf at all? The, it's like an online making platform. They have um, various journal publisher LaTeX templates built in that I believe you can then send directly to the publisher from that platform. So maybe that would keep sort of the formatting and layout consistent so that when you send them your LaTeX data, it's not, you know, it's not messing with the template. Could be something like that, but I have never personally submitted a manuscript in the data. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's overly, I think it's overly.com, or might be overly.org, I'm not sure. And uh, they have various publisher templates where you can write a manuscript online that it will convert, you know, the way text to the PDF. Any other questions? You might, you might have mentioned this, but is there any resource like the bail or anything that you can say to the publisher to be resolved? Like the authors? Or 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 the but the flip side is, I have never been that. Yeah. So apparently it's standard in science, but not science. Yeah, it's pretty common in science. I've signed my review sometimes with my name, but I don't know if the editor just scripts that off or not, but I've tried to kind of pass that through. Uh, so yeah, I don't think, because um, even as a peer reviewer, they, they specifically would agree to actually not sharing a peer review or telling anybody, you know, which manuscripts you've reviewed. So, um, it's, it's kind of a lockdown system right now in the country. There, there are a couple of uh, platforms. There's uh, the, the F, F1000 research. They have a built-in peer review system where you can see who's peer reviewed the article. But that's sort of the section right now that's in the publishing world. Did you say you could request to be able to review this article? In science engineering, in my experience, yes, you, you submit a list of uh, potential peer reviewers to the editor to choose from, and then that's up to the editor to you know, either use those or not use that, that subset of peer reviewers. Whether or not they're on their official forward. No, I mean, well, at least in chemistry and chemical information field, they don't typically have boards of peer reviewers. The peer reviewers are are not affiliated with the journal other than as a peer review or an author. So, um, you know, they basically go by expertise, you know, they're going to find people who are experts in that area. I guess most of your better journals for technical articles are always peer reviewed, the best thing to sign up. Yeah, um, usually for, for, for technical literature, but in engineering, there's just a ton of. Um, conference proceedings and other technical literature that's not necessarily peer reviewed, but it's uh, it's still good good technical literature. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, but then I have a question about yeah. conferences, because a lot of times you submit an article for a conference, then it becomes published. Right. But that has to be is that to be peer reviewed before it's presented at the conference? Sometimes. So okay. some of them are peer reviewed and the conference proceedings need to be peer reviewed. Some other ones are not peer reviewed and the conference is not peer reviewed. And so it, it, some of them can be difficult to determine whether or not they're peer reviewed. So you might have to look at the journal, uh, you know, the journal that, you know, about this journal or about this conference proceedings is that you'll, yeah, exactly, it's actually through the publisher's site to see if it's because frequently on conferences, they want you to submit your paper months before, right. and the abstract and then your paper months before. Right. I'm not sure if that's going to be A lot of times it is, there's panels that, that would do that, to review that, and so forth. Yeah, so it just depends on the discipline of the conference.
kind of further answer your question about the, you can know the reviewers of, of where you, potential reviewers, just kind of like underscore kind of what Tim was saying there. Some areas and some specialty areas, there may be only a few experts in the world on that particular subject matter that you're working on. You would most likely know who those those experts are. And so that would be very small cases, kind of the end of the tale, so to speak, that that's, uh, you know who those potential reviewers are, those particular experts are in that particular niche area of research. We certainly do appreciate all of you coming and uh, again just enjoying some food here. This is really good. This was uh, again the Graduate Student Association paid for the food beverage. Uh, what was the uh, Harrison's house? Yes, very good, very good food. So I uh, have to sell some coffee over there and there's some excellent fruit, muffins, and all so Help yourself that's really good. So, Again, if you, if you didn't sign the attendance sheet, please do that. Please put your name and your email address on here. Uh, I'd like to be able to follow up with you and uh, send you the uh, content here and, and keep, like I said, keep the conversation going. If you've got questions, we'd you know, love to entertain those.